Hello champions and welcome back. Uh, Mr. Chambers is out here at the Gila River uh, War Re Relocation Center. This is part of the Japanese internment camps that were all across the United States during World War II. So as I'm here, there's not a lot of buildings left over. They were all temporary buildings meant to last five, 10 years or as long as the war. Um, it's all farmland here, but I'll walk around the property to show you what's left here. Uh, but as we're reading Sylvia and Aki, we're learning about Post in Arizona, which was another Japanese internment camp uh, closer to the California border. With the Japanese internment camps, thousands of Japanese American citizens were forced to move away from their homes to usually the middle of the desert, where I am right now, uh, near Gila Bend or Sacatone, Arizona, about an hour south of our school. And they had no idea when they'd be able to go home. They had to relearn how to live their lives they were packed into cramped houses, tight quarters. Um, many of them were forced to work uh, while they were here, doing a lot of farming or a lot of manufacturing to help with the war effort. Um, but it was a lot. Um, here at Butte Camp, uh, it was part of the Gila River War Relocation Center. There was about 9,000 Japanese people living in just under one square mile. It may not seem terribly like a lot, but during World War II in 1942, this place, along with its um, sister camp, uh, had a total of 14,000 Japanese American citizens. At the time, that made these relocation centers some of the largest cities in the state of Arizona. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of words uh, to describe what kind of fear must have been in the air in the 1940s following the attack of Pearl Harbor and bringing the United States into World War II. So much fear, anger, frustration that led to the federal government saying that anybody who was born from Japan or had a grandparent from Japan or a great grandparent from Japan, if you had any Japanese heritage, you were a threat to national security, regardless of how long it's been since your family's actually been to Japan. And because you were a threat, the government forced you and your family to give up where you were going to school, what kind of jobs you had, your own homes, and forced you to move far away from anybody you knew to one of dozens of internment camps across the United States. Here in Arizona, we had uh, four or five major ones. We have Gila Bend, where I'm at right now. We had one up on Mount Lemmon, down near Tucson, and at least Poston, um, where Aki was brought uh, during the course of the book, Sylvia and Aki. But with that being said, life thrived. It wasn't perfect. The Japanese Americans who were forced to relocate to these places, their whole world was turned upside down. But they did try to make the best of it under these situations. I'm currently sitting on what would have been a watchtower and it overlooks, it's built up on a hill, it overlooks everything of where all the houses would be for the Japanese American citizens. So the United States soldiers would be stationed up here and they'd monitor all around to make sure everybody was 
being responsible and nothing was happening. It's not so much prison. I don't see any evidence of like barbed wire or whatnot, but from where I am, we're pretty much out in the middle of the desert. And at that time, Phoenix wasn't nearly as big as it is today. The Gila River Indians who were forced onto this reservation uh, through the American Indian Wars that we talked about with um, Sing Down the Moon, they weren't happy that their limited amount of land that they were given was now being shared with a bunch of outsiders who didn't belong here. So uh, there may not have been as much offenses, just natural barriers of, hey, if you wander out into the desert, you're wandering out into the desert. And whatever happens to you, happens to you. Um, just trying to recollect my thoughts here, because as I'm sitting here, my mind's just thinking, why? How could this have happened? And hopefully this never happens again, but history unfortunately has a way of repeating itself. And the only way we can stop it from coming to a point where we gather up everybody just because of their skin color or their nationality is to look back and think on history of what happened in the past, why we made mistakes and how we can be better for society. So I'm going to um, move around, show you different uh, points of interest around Butte Camp and just give you kind of a feel of what's going on here. I know normally with these things, I have you answer some questions. I just want you to think about how this impacts you, just looking at the things that I'm going to show you. Uh, what kind of things do you think, and so forth. So, bear with me as I try to do my best to film uh, the few remnants of buildings and the memorial site here, and uh, show you around what a Japanese relocation camp looked like, or looks like now, and imagine what it would have looked like 80 years ago during World War II. Okay, so without further ado, I'll show you around the place. Here's the view looking out from the watchtower area where Mr. Chambers was sitting before. As you can see, we've got some grid lines running across the ground. Those are the dirt roads where people would walk to go from their houses to the communal bathrooms, to the communal uh, dining room where they'd grab food and bring it back home. As I pan over here, uh, right where my finger's pointing here on the ground, with all these kind of places, those are old concrete barrier or foundations for central areas in the community. That was probably where the mess hall and uh, health office were. And as you look further out, you've got other foundations, which could have been houses. And these weren't family houses. These were houses where multiple families would live. Four or five families would live there. As I keep panning over, just notice the grid lines of all the roads where we are. Down here, we have my car parked in front of the memorial. This memorial was built, uh, I believe, in the 80s or 90s as a place where people could come to reflect on what the Japanese relocation treatment was like or what the internment camps were. We are uh, down ne near that memorial I showed you from up top. This memorial was conducted in the, constructed in the 80s or 90s as a place where people could come to think and reflect on what happened here supposed to be open windows looking out to a brighter future as it faces east. Looks to be what was a flagpole here in the middle, but unfortunately it's gone in disrepair and nobody's put a flag there. 
So here at this monument, there's two plaques here and I'm gonna do my best to read through and try to keep my camera steady for you, okay? So this memorial went up March 18th, 1995. This is the Butte Camp and I'll just read aloud what this says, okay? Up top is a picture of what it would have looked like with all the houses in place, just rows after rows of long houses where eight or nine families would live cramped together. Okay. Soon after the beginning of World War II, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. This order directed the removal of 110,000 Japanese Americans and their immigrant parents from the west coast of the USA. Over 13,000 were sent to Gila River Internment Center, made up of the canal and the Butte camps located on the Gila River Indian community land. Internees began to arrive at Butte Camp on August 21st, 1942. The population of 8,301 was at its peak on March 21st, 1943. The majority of the internees were from central Los Angeles and the south coastal regions of California. The main center hospital was located at Butte Camp with an annex and clinic located at the Canal Camp. The hospital had a 250-bed capacity. Five churches of Buddhist and Christian denominations were established. Other services such as a canteen, shoe repair shop, etc. were also available. Butte High School graduated 136 seniors in 1944. The high school published a newspaper called the Desert Centennial an annual yearbook called Years Flight. A total of 872 students graduated high school from both camps in 1943, 1944, and 1945. The central newspaper Gila News Courier was published up to tri-weekly with a Japanese section and was operated by the internees. The Butte Camp and the Gila River Interment Center were originally closed on November 16, 1945. The Monument Committee gratefully acknowledges the permission granted by the Gila River Indian community to erect these monuments on their land. And over here on the side, we have a map of what Butte Camp would have looked. So I'm currently up on top of this hill and it overlooks these grid systems that I try to point out of all the roads. And you'd have these long houses some central areas this was probably a commissary where people would grab food maybe have lunch or just head back to their homes just hundreds of houses and these weren't houses for one family these were houses for multiple families at the corners you see the slightly bigger buildings those were probably communal restrooms and i believe aki talks about how uncomfortable she felt using these restrooms they were more or less wide open flimsy doors there were showers but you had to wait in line in order to use that and there would be one communal restroom for each block of what looks like 12 to 15 houses so you're thinking maybe 40 different families per section had to use one communal bathroom so Things. All right, so we're down the hill now looking at some of the foundations. We've got the monument on top of the hill. We got the watchtower platform where I started. And now we're down here where we've got the foundation of one of the houses. And so they would have been temporary houses that they would have put up on the pillars so they, they didn't have to flatten the land. And we've got that this is about a four by six grid. Each of the pillars is about eight feet apart, six to eight feet apart. So you can say that overall the dimensions of this would be 24 feet long by 48 feet. So if you were to think of that in terms of square footage, if I did 50 times 25, small houses. And 
as I've said before, these houses weren't just one family. It wasn't one family that lived in here with a living room, a kitchen, bathroom. It was three or four families that would all share that main entranceway here on the stairs. They'd go in and there'd probably be four different rooms. And the rooms are probably eight by 20 feet or about 150 square feet. And uh, just standing here, it feels tiny. It feels like you'd get maybe a bed in here, but they'd fit three or four bunk beds per room so that families of five could share that tiny space. And then you had thin walls so you'd hear your neighbors and everything that they were saying, everything that they were doing. You all had to go in and out of the same front door and you'd have to walk to a communal space further down where the bathroom would be. A view of what we can see now as evidence of the internment, of the Japanese internment camps here in Arizona that we had during World War II that Aki was sent to with her family in the book of Sylvia and Aki. So thank you for joining me on this adventure.